Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast, Successfully Migrating Digital Collections, Documenting Baylor University's Migration of Contents to Cortex. Brought to you by Library Journal and sponsored by Cortex. My name is Lisa Peet. I'm the news editor at Library Journal, and I will be your moderator. But before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. Your screen is completely customizable. You can resize any of the windows and move them around, so feel free to adjust as needed to get the most out of your desktop space. If you accidentally close any of your windows, you can bring them back up by clicking the appropriate widget down at the bottom of your screen. And if you have any questions for our presenters during the webcast, and we sure hope you do, you can submit them through the Q&A window at any time, and we will address those at the end of the webcast. A copy of today's slide deck is available in the resource list window, and you'll be able to download your CE certificate from the certification window once you've met the viewing requirements. You can tweet us at, at Library Journal with the hashtag LJCortex. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, click on the Help widget where you can find system requirements and FAQs. And if that doesn't resolve your issue, please send a note through the Q&A window. And now I would like to introduce our panelists. We have Daryl Storr, Director of Digitization and Digital Preservation at Baylor University. Daryl oversees all digitization projects undertaken by the Digitization Projects Group. He also exercises primary oversight of the group's technology system, including data security and backups, systems integrity, and digital asset management. Martin Drew is Head of Customer Engagement at Adam Matthew. Since joining Adam Matthew in 2014 as senior publisher, Martin has worked with a number of libraries and archives around the world. He's now working with some of these same archives and many others to explore open access publishing of their content through the Cortex platform, which has been developed by Adam Matthew Digital specifically to showcase digital collections. And now I'm going to let the panelists take it away. Many thanks, Lisa. Um, this is Martin speaking. Um, I'm going to uh, very briefly run through um, a, bit, a very quick introduction to Cortex and Adam Matthew, and then pass over to Daryl, and he's going to, he's the real star of the show, he's been doing all the work on the migration, so um, he's going to run us through the actual migration process itself as well. Um, very briefly, um, to those of you joining us today who, who don't know Adam Matthew, uh, I just want to give you a little introduction. Adam Matthew uh, has been going for about 30 years. We started off as a publisher of microfilm collections and moved to digital about 15 years ago. Uh, since then, we've published about 130 collections. We publish a, a maximum of 10 a year, um, with the emphasis on quality, obviously. And we publish across a range of subjects. Uh, I've got here on the slide, you might not be able to see in detail, but some examples of what we've published. Um, for example, American Indian newspapers. We publish papers from the East India Company, um, from the British Library. We publish, uh, one example here is um, 19th Century Literary Society, which is the John Murray Publishing Archive, which is fantastic, with the largest collection of Byronalia in the world as well. Um, so just a few examples of the sort of thing that we do. Um, obviously, we publish all these digitally now. So we need a framework to do that and Cortex is that framework it's the software underlying all the collections we publish from now on we have had previous iterations of that but everything we publish in the future will be published on Cortex as well and we'll gradually migrate our backlist across too we have one other collection I just want to highlight today this is the mass observation project now mass observation itself um, is probably our flagship collection, uh, certainly our biggest selling collection. And this is documenting the social research project that went in the UK between 1937 and 1967. The Mass Observation Project is the following from that, so it's sort of the adjunct to it. Um, and this collection publishes this week. It's the first collection we've published on the Cortex software. Um, and as I say, from now on, we'll be publishing everything else on Cortex too. Now, Cortex is different because this is the first time we've licensed our software to um, external parties, to uh, libraries, archives, and any other institution that wants to publish their digitized archival content. 
So we've obviously had lots of considerations to bring in there, and it's been great working with partners such as Baylor and Daryl um, through that development process. Development is obviously ongoing, and we're, we're listening to customers and trying to meet as many needs as we can as we go. Um, so very briefly about Cortex itself, um, it is secure, scalable. It obviously needs to scale. Um, it's cloud-based on AWS. Um, it offers hosting and streaming of AV content as well. So all your audiovisual content can be um, hosted and shown through Cortex. And also, in addition to that, it allows some full text search features as well. So if you do have AV content hosted in Cortex, you can run an auto transcription actually in the platform to make that full text searchable. Obviously, you can do the same sort of thing with print content so that you can use in platform OCR to make that searchable. And you have exclusive access to our handwritten um, X recognition uh, software which makes manuscript searchable with a very high degree of accuracy as well. Uh, Cortex um, also allows creation of digital exhibits, so you don't have to slavishly reproduce your digital collections, though you might want to do that too. You can reproduce uh, digital, co uh, digital exhibits across different collections, and they can be published on a permanent or temporary basis, obviously. Um, it's highly configurable, so it allows lots of different navigation options, and these are built into the platform. I think Daryl will talk a bit about use of the CMS, um, though we'll cover the migration as, as the bulk of the presentation. Um, finally, it supports uh, custom metadata schemas in the platform, and I know Daryl will certainly talk about that too. So just a very quick overview. Of course, if you have got any queries or you want to know more about Cortex, um, I've got a link to our demo site in the slides here. We'll feature these at the end as well, that you can get in touch with, with any of our team and we'll be able to talk through any details or answer questions today as well, of course, if you have. Um, so after that very brief introduction, I think we get to the, the meat of the webinar and I'll pass over to Daryl as well to run us through what he's been doing for, for uh, the recent months. Uh, Daryl, over to you. All right, thank you, Martin. Yeah, for uh, for uh, yeah, nearly a year at this point. So um, anyway, uh, thanks uh, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. Um, it's great to be able to talk to you all uh, about our digital collection migration, especially at this point um, where we are, where the bulk of the work has has been done. Um, so uh, we've built the majority of our sixty three collections uh, from incredible libraries and archives across campus. We have a strong collaborative relationship with the folks that work in the libraries you see listed here on the slide. We've worked on many projects throughout the years. They've supported us by helping with uh, equipment purchases uh, to put in the digitization center and funding at times for temporary positions for special projects that we work on with them to help build the 63 collections um, over nearly 20 years now. And so it's been a nice long collaborative process with them. Just want to mention a, a few of our successful projects and collections before moving on to the migration. Uh, one of them, our Spencer Collection of American Popular Sheet Music, is out of our Fine Arts Library archive. It contains nearly 30,000 pieces of music collected by Francis Spencer and purchased by the Baylor Libraries back in 1965. This collection was the first large collection we migrated to Cortex. Um, it's our most accessed collection throughout the years and our oldest collection. The collection contains pieces that span the late 18th to early 20th century, along with its music, complements other areas of study with its cover art and lyrics, including Texas and American history, art, political science, and sociology. And it's arranged in over 200 subject categories. Our Browning Letters Collection from the Armstrong Browning Library on campus contains correspondence to and from Elizabeth and Robert Browning, Letters are scattered across the globe, but we can bring them together virtually online. Building this letter collection and getting the opportunity to work collaboratively with other institutions has been rewarding for the libraries and for the team. We have letters from Wellesley College in this collection, Ohio State, Ransom Center at University of Texas, Balliol College, Texas A&M, and we're currently working with other institutions like Trinity College in Hartford uh, and also Eaton College. And uh, finally, I'll mention our Black Gospel Music Restoration Project, the Royce Darden Collection. 
This project started back in 2007. The goal of this project is to find gospel music, digitize it, catalog and preserve a digital copy, as well as make as many copies as possible of, uh, accessible online. So for this collection, we're proud to have some of the digitized audio tracks in the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Thanks, Daryl. Great to get a flavor of some of the amazing collections that you have and the diversity across them. And all these, all these collections, these 63 collections, are digitized, yeah? Yes, yes, absolutely, yep. Over about a 20-year period. Yeah, so can you give us an idea of the result? Because you've got a decent resource to do that, obviously. We do. We've been very fortunate. Um, the, the group that administers Cortex is the Digitization and Digital Preservation Services Group, and we operate the digi Digitization Center in the library. Um, we opened this facility up in 2008, so it's a square, the 5,000 square foot space containing specialized digitiza digitization equipment for digitizing books. We can do maps, blueprints, paintings, um, various audio formats uh, like analog discs, cassettes, and reel-to-reels. Um, also a variety of video formats, uh, Betacam, Betamax, et cetera. Uh, and then more recently, we can now do eight millimeter and 16 millimeter film. Um, Cortex comes with a, a nice exhibit feature, which we plan to use more extensively in the future for highlighting collections, especially new collections, or when we add to new collections. Uh, we tested it out a bit uh, by highlighting some of the equipment in the center. Um, so the exhibit contains videos of some of our equipment in action, um, and you could check that out later at some point uh, using, that, using that link below. Yeah, great. Thanks, Daryl. And um, we share relevant URLs later as well. Um, but we can, we'll, we'll just show the site briefly at the end of the presentation. We can show that you can find that as well. Um, but so for all this digitized content you had, Daryl, um, you were making this available to the public. What were you using previously? Right. So um, we were a, a previous Content DM user, um, started using it back in 2003, um, first running a, our own instance on campus with our own hardware, um, and then about six years ago moving uh, to a hosted version just to kind of make things a little bit easier on us, especially as the digitization demands were increasing in our center. So um, some of the issues that we were, uh, that were lacking in ContentDM are issues that we we're facing, some system issues or limitations. And these are issues that we had to deal with over the course of about 10 plus years. Um, some of these may be fixed now, but nevertheless, we had to wrestle with them at some point. So um, first, we really wanted an easier way to batch update metadata. Um, our, our projects go back so far, you know, back to 1999 when we weren't doing things uh, as correctly as we should have. And so we really needed um, uh, an easier way to uh, batch update our metadata. And unfortunately, uh, content DM functionality would not meet our needs um, over the many years uh, to do this. Also, the Content DM project client, which is the software necessary for uh, uploading and, and editing records, um, it was outdated, and at some point, uh, development ceased on the, the application. It was also a Windows-only product. Um, the web configuration utility for customizing pages uh, was not very intuitive. Functionality was a bit limited and became more limited uh, when security issues were found um, in, the, in the more recent years. So at some point, uh, the development of the Content DM version 6 interface stopped uh, to move and shift to a responsive design interface. But uh, when the responsive design launched, uh, we, we were able to test it, and we just found that it was too buggy uh, to make the move to responsive. So we uh, ended up living with the bugs in version 6 uh, until our, our move to Cortex now. Um, also, uh, there's no batch editing um, of public access access permissions. So say you wanted to lock down a portion of a collection and maybe that involved, you, you know, 100 or 200, 300 records. Uh, unfortunately, this was a one by one task to lock each of them, them down, unless you were locking down a whole collection, which was easy, but um, we don't currently have one of those collections. And so one of the methods to lock down items is, is IP filtering um, for access control. And that was available through Content DM, but unfortunately it only worked with the first 5,000 IP addresses and would unfortunately block IP addresses over the 5,000. Again, this may be something that was fixed, but we had to wrestle with it at some point. 
Also, um, our instance uh, during an update at some point lost uh, full text search highlighting in the version six interface. And the only way to fix this was to commit and move over to the responsive design interface. And like I said, we weren't ready to do that. And overall, we just felt like the development of the interface was just generally slower than, than we would have liked, slower than expected. Yeah. And um, what of those um, issues do you think caused you the most frustration, would you say? I mean, sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, regressive bugs uh, were a big one. We would, we would uh, kind of wait for an update, hoping a new feature would, be, would come along. And unfortunately, sometimes some of those bugs would, would, uh, would show up and, and you know, two steps forward, one step back sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. that, that was the most frustrating. But also, I'll add to that the, uh, the metadata overlay. It was a feature that other systems uh, provide that functionality, um, and we really, really wanted it. But um, at the time we were communicating with them, uh, it wasn't something that it sounded like was on their roadmap, on their development roadmap. So we really wanted that. And so that at times when we had to do a lot of work in metadata, um, yeah, caused some frustration. Because it was just too hard to edit your metadata. Yeah, too hard. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, or time consuming. Yeah, time consuming. But yeah. Still, though, um, taking on a migration is quite a thing. Um, so, what was it that finally made you decide to do it? And, and why did you choose Cortex to move to? Sure. Um, well, a few things that attracted us to Cortex. Um, one, um, uh, easy to use CMS for customizing um, the pages in the site. Uh, during training, we received a 30-minute session on this. Um, our digitization coordinator, Allison Riley, who's got no HTML or development experience, customized all of these pages following that 30-minute 30, 30 training session. Um, and she also migrated all of our landing page content from ContentDM uh, to Cortex. On the administrative side, we really like the, um, the filtering options that are available when uh, wanting to do some bulk editing right in the browser. Uh, and overall, the, um, the web administrative interface is quite powerful. So, and as I mentioned, we really like the, the, the metadata overlay capabilities. As I mentioned, it's a feature we always wanted with ContentDM, the ability to download the metadata from your collection and then edit it in an interface of your choice, whether it's Google Sheets, OpenRefine, Excel, and then take this data and then overwrite it uh, was just huge for us. And um, all of this uh, uh, with our with our own uh, unique identifiers that we've created. That is the, the link between the metadata and the items um, in the Cortex system. So other thing, uh, cross-platform uploader at this point, um, about half of our machines in our center are Macs. And so the ability to download an uplo uh, uploader for the Mac or PC was um, quite convenient. And, uh, and finally, a, um, a well-implemented controlled vocabulary interface. Um, our previous metadata librarian configured the controlled vocabulary fields for us, um, and terms that do not fit will show up in the interface as needing approval. Uh, they can be deleted or combined with, with other terms. So um, about five years ago, we looked into other possible solutions to replace ContentDM, but we, we never really hit the, is a migration worth all the work mark um, and you know do the benefits outweigh the work it will take to do a, a system migration and so with a small number of staff members available to work on a migration the gain needed to be worth it and we felt like we finally uh finally found that with cortex mm, that's good thank you um i i'm glad yeah um that slide i think showed some of the the um, CMS styling options available. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, it's so in Cortex, just if you're wondering what that <laughs> visual was. Um, but you can see a bit more of the, if you want to see a bit more of the back-end functionality of Cortex, obviously you can um, contact Adam Matthew for a demo, anyone. Um, but now, Daryl, um, once you decided that it was worthwhile moving to Cortex, um, can you tell us how you actually took that on, how you approached the pro process? Sure, absolutely. So, um, so to migrate, um, we exported the metadata from ContentDM at the collection level as tab delimited files. Um, we included all of the compound object and the image level metadata in these file exports. So ContentDM was our definitive set of metadata for the collections um, over the years as we worked in ContentDM. Any updates that we needed to do to the metadata, um, they were done in ContentDM. So, 
Um, we also, we took advantage of this opportunity to fix some issues like the controlled vocabulary and ID issues that we wanted to fix years ago. Um, Cortex was kind of, the move to Cortex was kind of a, a nice catalyst for this. So our very early digital collections um, have extensive schema. And so a handful of collections had their schema simplified, um, especially when we learned that uh, many of the fields were hardly used over the years. So we took the opportunity to do that as well. So we use Google Sheets to edit um, and make these changes uh, because this provided simultaneous multi-user access for the couple of people that were working on this. Uh, there's a nice history function in Google Sheets that we could use that if we did some extensive processing or manipulating of the data and we weren't happy with the results, it was easy to roll back. So our metadata librarian, um, who was already working on a library systems platform migration, um, implemented and enhanced our CV lists, our controlled vocabulary lists in Cortex for us prior to starting. We created the collections and used Cortex field mapping to create a template to handle the import of the content DM data into Cortex for each collection. So once a field mapping was created for a collection, um, it was saved and always available for re-uploads or you know, re-uploading uh, metadata if we, if we forgot something and, and needed to do that. So we took advantage of it several times uh, because sometimes we wouldn't notice something until after a upload. And it's very easy to fix in the spreadsheet and then simply re-upload against the template overriding the data. So that was, that was very nice. We also created metadata groups during the migration. Uh, we started with a standard set since all collections contain a core set of metadata. Um, because some of our collections have extended schema, we added customized field, fields to either a, a metadata group uh, of a similar type, say for example, uh, a, a metadata group for newspapers, for correspondence or annuals. Um, then at times, if necessary, we can add a metadata group for a specific collection if, if it was very collection specific. So when creating the collection uh, you have, when creating the new collection, you have the option to associate any of these metadata sets that you create and manage with the collection. So it's a very nice feature. And after we were past, uh, say, maybe the first 10 collections, uh, this started to save us time, configuration time, when setting up metadata for new collections. So we, we made uh, a, a kind of an early decision uh, to re-OCR all of our text-based images so search terms would be properly highlighted in Cortex, and so we could take advantage of a newer version of the Abbey OCR engine. Much of our original OCR was generated with uh, Abbey version 8, uh, and Cortex is using version 11, um, and so we wanted to take, take advantage of that as well. Cortex will import your Abbey generated OCR XML data, um, but it was something that we just passed on just because we didn't want to make use of the, the older OCR. Hmm. Um, originally, we relied on the Content DM project client in our workflow to do all of the compression of our images during the upload. Um, before, uh, before the migration, we wanted more control over the access files at the collection level in Cortex and say, you know, we want to set the compression level like this. We want to set the resolution like that for, for each of the collections. And so, um, so we didn't uh, simply move our assets from Content DM into Cortex. We actually went back to our preservation files, compressed each collection, and we used Image Magic uh, on a, a pretty powerful Linux server um, to create these new um, new uh, uh, access surrogates. And so we wanted more efficient comp compression. We wanted to reduce the, the footprint, especially when we're talking about uh, a million images. Yeah, yeah, a lot of images. Um, yeah, so quite a few points you raised there. I mean, one I'll just pick up on. Um, with your metadata preparation, were you thinking then, were you actively thinking about the presentation of metadata on the site um, as you prepared it, was that oh. one of the key elements? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yes. And what was the experience of using the OCR facility compared to um, in Cortex compared to Content DM, for example? Yeah, it, it's a good question. Um, Content DM, and I'm not sure if they've changed this uh, over the last year, but um, relies on OCR in the client workstation. So we had to have enough power. Um, for our uploading workstation, for the workstation was dedicated to the project client in order to process that OCR. So metadata, images, and OCR processing, oh, and actually digital access, the access surrogate processing all takes place on those workstations. So at that time, we, we needed heftier workstations to be able to do this in a reasonable amount of time. 
it's much easier to get this uploaded and have this take place as a you know an additional service that runs in Cortex that we could set to run at any time and not tie up one of our workstations. So um, I think it's a little bit better design. Yeah. Um, so obviously, this is already looking like it was a time-consuming process. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you you um, you set your timeline, I suppose, and I understand that you. Stuck to it quite well as well. Can you run so, through so, how yeah, you sure. that and the resources you had to do it? That would yeah, be... definitely. Yeah, surprisingly stuck to it because back in the summer 2019, we were just kind of pulling this stuff, you know, just it felt very random. Uh, and then it, it started to come together as we got in the fall semester. And so this is the timeline uh, that, we, that we set. So uh, tested and training at the end of uh, the 2019 summer semester. Um, what we did do was we prioritized the collection based on based on their popularity. So what collections were we going to migrate first? So we identified the top 10 collections that were the most accessed collections since 2013. So um, two of us had, a, had about an hour and a half training on this before we were off in testing. So we really felt like an hour and a half was a, a good enough amount of time for us to actually get testing on the site. Um, so uh, for the migration, we mostly had two full timers, uh, myself and our digitization coordinator, um, Allison, and we both gave about 60 to 100 percent of our time uh, throughout any given week during the migration from the fall semester until we went live uh, March 30th. So um, I will say that uh, Allison handled all of the CMS customization. Uh, and then at some point, I believe in, it was February, she popped over to help me with some of the data migration, um, uh, which helped out tremendously. I don't know that we would have made that deadline in time. We also had a full-time temporary employee that uh, the Dean of Libraries provided for us, which was extraordinarily helpful, Evangeline. Um, and then a 29 hour a week grad student, Sam, who also helped us. So they handled most of the manual work at times when we had to do manual work, uh, especially with IDs and metadata. Um, and at times the, they had to provide detective services when objects just weren't matching up with the metadata IDs, especially in some of the older collections. So I um, also wanna mention just a few others in our group that indirectly helped Stephen, Travis and Libby. Uh, they took on additional duties so that Allison and I really could focus on the migration. And we did, Allison and I spent the, the vast majority of our time on the migration, especially uh, towards the end. So we used Basecamp uh, to communicate questions after the training to Cortex support. Um, and uh, as we were getting uh, familiar with the platform, we would just fire off questions and quickly get those answered through Basecamp um, and then had a couple of touch base meetings. But that's all we really needed to get to get going. Now, obviously, for our group, we were very familiar with Content DM running a local host uh, uh, instance and then moving to hosted. So, so we had a good idea how the digital collections work, and I, I think that that plays a big part um, in in not needing too much training. But anyway, our first goal was to move the first ten collections uh, by winter break, and we did manage to do that. Uh, met the deadline, um, but more importantly, we created a model for nearly each of the compound object types in Content DM. And so we, we wanted to apply this model to similar collections moving forward in early 2020, and we were able to do that. So we managed to work through our priority list. We hit each mark for the next few months uh, with just a couple of exceptions. So January, we were, so we knocked out the 10 by December, knocked out 17 in January, 20 in February, and then the last 17 uh, in March. Um, one process that ran a little bit behind was the OCR. OCR is obviously CPU intensive, and when you're talking about you know, hundreds of thousands of, of images that need processing, that process falls behind. And, and um, so it could fall anywhere between two weeks to a month behind. And so we're actually running OCR on the final collection uh, this week, um, which is very exciting that we're, we're hitting that, that point. So at this point, the heaviest lifting is done, I'd say. Um, our collections have been migrated. We're still fine tuning. We're updating CMS pages. Um, I hope a month or two into the fall semester, um, we're past this last phase um, and we can move into a maintenance phase um, and then begin loading uh, more new collections. Yeah, even when you are organized, it's a, it is a time consuming process, I guess. But to make that easier, you obviously had to develop a robust workflow. We did, yeah. So, um, so first, uh, and I, I 
it's not a highly detailed diagram, very high overview, but, um, and sorry, my, probably my most technical slide of the presentation. Um, and you all can feel free to shoot me emails about it later on if you, if you want more details. But first, uh, we started by creating our collections in Cortex as we were moving through our priority list. We configured metadata ahead of the collection migrating. We configured the metadata templates to pair with the content DM field names, get them to pair up with the Cortex field names. So we updated IDs as necessary, verified all assets were accounted for on the preservation server before we entered this workflow that you see here. So this workflow diagram has two pipelines. Uh, the top is the metadata export from content DM and import into Cortex. Uh, and the bottom is the digital object path. So starting up at the top, um, we, did, we determined that we need to deal with basically four types of objects from our content DM instance. And these were models that we created in December. So there were single objects, there were compound objects, there were compound objects with metadata at the top level of the record and page or image level of the record and possibly with transcripts. Um, there's also compound objects with image level metadata, uh, for example, like with our gospel collection. And I think we mentioned that a little bit later. So anyway, um, our previous metadata librarian, uh, Kara, uh, she made some great decisions and updates on the metadata and content DM prior to this export. Uh, and so for many of the fields that she was able to work with, she gave us some healthier metadata as we moved to export it um, uh, for the final time out of content DM. So we exported this metadata in a tab delimited format. We imported it into Google Sheets. Um, we decided to use Google Sheets um, uh, where we use it in our center all the time. So. But we used a combination of Google Sheets, um, uh, BB Edit, which is a text editor, and then also a, a wide array of standard Linux command line tools that we use to verify data um, and manipulate the data as necessary. So using Google Sheets, um, we, we could decide what data needed to be updated, what we could script, and what needed human work, which would get passed to Evangeline and Sam. Um, and I apologize to this day for that. Um, we also uh, could visually inspect the collection in the spreadsheet um, view, and we could look for some abnormalities of the data, either from um, some of which came directly from the export. Uh, there was a special character or something in there that may have tripped something up, and, and spreadsheet view was a good way uh, to just quality check that. Cortex makes use of a document ID that we can specify, and this is something that Content DM took away at some point. We used to provide our own IDs, um, and they unfortunately at some po point replace those digital IDs with a sequence number. Um, and so uh, we really like the way Cortex implements this. We can use our own uh, digital IDs. And so what we needed to do to prepare for the Cortex import was we needed to add a document ID field, but that was simply our digital ID that was already contained in every content DM record we exported. We made great use of filtering in the Google Sheets. Um, it was a very easy way to deal with the content DM export because we could um, we could hide certain fields. So uh, we could be, we could easily filter metadata to isolate only the compound object metadata and then work on that metadata. And if we need to, to work on a collection that had image level metadata, then we could hide the compound object level metadata and then work specifically on the image level. I um, also want to point out that Content DM stores its OCR or transcript data in a metadata field. Cortex does not do that. Uh, I think this is a much better design, actually. Um, and so when migrating human created transcripts um, that we had in, in Content DM, we needed to extract this data from an image level record. Um, and so we did that um, using some Linux tools. Um, we created a text file that paired with each of these images um, for those collections. Uh, and this was a good amount of work, but after a couple, we were able to script this process out as well. So once this was complete, um, the metadata was, was, was complete in, in Google Sheets. We were able to export it into BB Edit, our text editor, and do a final uh, quality control um, and do a couple of um, uh, uh, command line passes on it just to verify some of the data. So we'd save it out as a tab delimited file again, and then this file was uploaded to Cortex. And what I really love about Cortex is that it does not dictate um, that metadata and assets be uploaded at the same time like Content DM does with their project client, or even in a specific order. Um, this really gave us maximum flexibility and efficiency during the migration. We could upload images first, we could upload metadata first, it, it didn't matter. And then knowing that we could just run OCR at a later time just gave us maximum flexibility. 
So the, the bottom pipeline that you see uh, in this slide uh, is for the, for the assets. And so, um, as I mentioned, we regenerated all of our access files from preservation files. So the preservation files were verified to match IDs against the metadata. Um, any file name updates that were updated on the preservation server would then get updated um, in the Google Sheet at this point. Then we converted batches of the preservation assets in parallel um, for any given collection. Um, but what we could do is we could test compression and resolution settings for a letter, which is obviously going to be very different than say a, you know, a text heavy, text dense newspaper. Um, and so we tested each of those before we did a mass parallel processing on that. Um, we did use shell scripts uh, to compress these preservation files so we could run those overnight um, after we went home. Uh, and these were generated and pushed to a Cortex staging area. From there, we could point the Cortex uploader uh, to the directory and then upload. Uh, the uploader uh, that uh, Cortex provides is a very simple piece of software. It doesn't, doesn't do much but upload, but it's solid. Uh, for many collections, uploading would take more than one day, and the uploader would just chug along without crashing. Um, and uh, very reliable, we could walk away from it at the end of the day and just know that the next morning it's going to be somewhere in the process of uploading. Um, unfortunately, our content DM client was notorious for crashing throughout the years. Um, and we would set to leave at night, and unfortunately, sometimes it would crash on like the second or third record, and we wouldn't really gain much overnight. Um, so um, anyway, so uh, the, the uploader solid pushes it to con uh, pushes it to Cortex, and it's ready to go. And then at that point, um, with metadata and the digital objects lining up, the asset becomes complete and ready for publishing. And, um, and even after it's published, we can run OCR. So at that point, we'll run o OCR. Um, at any time it's convenient as long as the OCR engine isn't running on something else. So sorry for that very long slide, but that's top level overview of our migration. I, th I think everyone appreciates that it's a complex process and important to get the workflow sorted, yeah. Um, but uh, obviously moving to a different platform as well, um, Daryl, there are things that Content DM does that Cortex doesn't do. There are things that Cortex does that Content DM doesn't, um, and so there are things I suppose you had to consider you would treat differently. Um, do you want to run us through those? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so obviously display differences uh, between the previous platform and Cortex. So, and Content DM offers some nice options for displaying your content. Um, one of the things we, we we lost the ability to build um, a compound <laughs> object that would contain a whole PDF along with a handful of audio files. And this was typical for our oral history collection. And so we knew this was going to be something that we would have to, um, we'd have to come up with a solution and make sure that for the stakeholders, for the Institute for Oral History, that they were okay with this. So as I mentioned, ContentDM would allow us to just take a whole PDF, put it inside of a compound object, and then put all of the, um, the, the audio files in there. And so um, what we did um, was we decided to break up the, uh, have a record for the transcript and have a record for the audio. They have the exact same metadata, except one is uh, uh, of, of audio uh, and one is transcripts. But what we did was um, we made use of Cortex's related assets field um, and this, this field can actually be batch loaded with the metadata, so we can actually have our transcript record point to our audio record and our audio record point to our transcript record all in the metadata. Um, first, when we first started to do this, it was a manual process, and so this was a recent Cortex update and a, and a, and a welcomed update. So, um, and, and this is mainly an issue with us uh, because we, we really, we already have transcripts that the Institute for Oral History um, has meticulously created, uh, and they didn't want to, uh, go with an audio to text uh, transcription at this point. They want, you know, they spent, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours on these things. And so we are not transcribing in platform. So we really want to make use of these. Um, and so this was our solution for this. Um, some of this will change. Uh, soon Cortex will provide ingest of pre existing uh, AV transcripts. And so we'll see how that works once that's released in Cortex. So the gospel collection um, that Content DM took advantage of a more complex hierarchical compound object structure, like we could have uh, a folder of images and then a folder of audio, and so that that provided some decent navigation, and, and we took advantage of that because uh, Content DM offered that. Um, 
But uh, we, we had to work closely with the Cortex team. Uh, we had to explain what we needed to get this gospel collection to work. Um, since it would not really display well under their initial audio interface. And so we worked with them closely and uh, they were able to deploy a new interface for this collection and for others that have a collection similar to the gospel collection. Um, they delivered it three weeks ahead of, ahead of time uh, of, of the deadline. And so we had plenty of time to upload test uh, well before we went to our go live date. So. The new audio interface allows us to uh, specify audio track names in the image level metadata load file. So this changed our workflow for the better from ContentDM where uh, ContentDM wanted the names of the tracks actually in the file names, which was, I felt a little sloppy. Um, and so you can see in the image to, your, to the right on your screen, uh, the contents tab displays links to the images and the track names of that record. Uh, these track Titles are easily added. Uh, they can be updated simply by overlaying image level metadata for this collection. So it's a, it's a, it's a nice change to our workflow. Yeah, and it was good to work with you on um, seeing what those requirements were and, and, and trying to meet those, Daryl, as well. Yeah, um, so it's a good, good addition. Um, but uh, you must be very relieved. I know you're very relieved to have completed the migration now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just checking it. You've already referenced a couple of things that you're you're going to do now in the in the near future. Um, do you want to run us through sure. some of those? Yeah. So yeah, absolutely, completely relieved that most of the difficult work is done at this point. Um, we are still updating collections. We're making changes at this point. Um, to the metadata, we, we want to ensure that they function as the collection stakeholders expect, um, especially now that we are in a new system. Um, much of the migration process was automated in batch chunks. Um, and so we're finding some issues of the collection uh, and oral history is one of them uh, that we just found out a couple of days ago that there, there, are, there are some missing items that we need to deal with. Um, and that is because we had to batch um, uh, upload and, and batch process uh, some big chunks. Um, so we'll be working with that as well. So uh, we currently have over 1 million files uploaded. Um, nearly a terabyte of data now has gone into Cortex. Um, this will change. Uh, we're about to move on to some video collections that we've been holding on to for a little bit over a year now. Uh, and those will go into Cortex um, uh, later this summer. Um, our Browning letters, our Victorian letters, the Royce Darden Black Gospel Collection, Spencer Collection, uh, the Lariat Student Newspaper Collection, they've all been used by faculty for teaching in the classroom uh, and for graduate student research. With classes moving to uh, online only this, um, this past spring semester, the Spencer Sheet Music Collection was used by a fashion forecasting and trend analysis course. Uh, they use covers from the collection to research fashions. Uh, from sheet music covers from specific periods of time uh, to see what was popular uh, and how that might change in the future. So while we're still making changes to the site, we're also loading uh, content from new collections that continue to build up and continue to get digitized uh, during the 2019 and 2020 um, migration period. So even though Allison and I were pushing hard in the migration, uh, the rest of the digitization center was still kind of puttering along and, and creating more content. So. Um, moving forward, our Victorian letters collection has been mostly transcribed by a graduate student. And so we're gonna make use of Cortex's handwriting text recognition technology for the first time to generate transcripts for all of the untranscribed letters in this collection. Um, next also is metadata harvesting uh, on our immediate list so that we can provide metadata to our new discovery layer. And then we're also looking forward to um, making use of the new, some of the new Cortex functionality that's coming soon, uh, like editing AV transcripts. I think that's something that we'll, we'll make use of as we make use of, the, uh, of that functionality. Um, also viewing HTR transcripts. Right now you can do handwriting text recognition on a handwritten letter, um, and then you can search it within the letter, um, but unfortunately you can't view an actual transcript. So, um, I believe that's also on the on the roadmap. And then a big one for us is access controls. So um, we won't, we have not there are there are many items that we haven't uploaded because we don't have an access control mechanism with Cortex yet. Um, and so I believe that's coming very soon. And then once that's done, we can upload those objects and then put them behind a Baylor associated login. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it for me. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, thanks a lot, Daryl. Um, that's uh, run us through your migration process in quite some detail. Um, but we, at this point, if I can share my screen, which I hope works okay, we thought we could link out to show some of the work that you've been doing and what that's resulted in. So I'm just trying to share my screen now. This takes a little time. But I'm hoping that surely you should be able to see uh, yeah, a screen share there. So that's telling me that you can see my screen. So I, I hope that's true. Yeah, OK, so just double checking that. So here we go. This is the Bailey University Library's Digital Collections homepage. And you'll see here the um, the Baylor green and yellow in terms of the styling um, and some of the footer design with links, the um, social media links, for example. Um, and coming back up to the top of the page, the branding here, which is all customizable. Um, and again, opportunity to share some of the digital objects through social media, the search features. This is a My Account feature, which allows you to bookmark certain assets and to save searches as well. Here there's a um, high contrast option. And this is the primary navigation. And here, Alison, who's worked in the CMS, has actually chosen to reproduce those options here in the um, sidebar navigation as well. So there's various routes into content. And again, all of these are customizable. This, by the way, is a link to the exhibit that Daryl referenced earlier, which shows some detail of the digitization center. So we'll, we'll share this URL. Do feel to, free to dig into any of this. But I'm just going to show you some routes into content because we're getting a little short of time. So you can here navigate to a landing page created for each of the libraries um, represented by Daryl's team at Baylor. So you can go through to a landing page for the Armstrong Browning Library, for example. And then just while that's loading. And then the way that Alison has actually set this up is that um, the, all the Armstrong Browning Library's collections will then be uh, represented uh, and linked to from that landing page. Um, once it comes through, this is always a case with a live demo, isn't it? Here we go. Let's try navigating direct to a different page to the collection on this. Forgive me, this might be my Wi Fi. Here we go. Right, here we go. Sorry, my bad. So here we go. This is another route in. This is through the collections list. So this is just an opportunity. You can see the amount of collections that Baylor have actually managed to bring in here. So this is the, I think, 63, 64 collections Daryl had referenced. These links through to um, collections pages. So we can link from here, for example, to here's the Black Gospel Music collection that Daryl referenced earlier. Here, this is then a filtered list of um, items in that collection. Um, and you can hear that you can click on each of these. So this is one asset. Um, you can navigate through the asset like this, through the images or the audio collections. It's a complex compound object. And here's the contents tab that Daryl was referencing that we built out. So you can navigate to each of the items that way as well by the track title, for example. Now, if we go back to, let's say this is fine now, to the institution landing page. Here we go. So this is the Armstrong Browning Library. And here, the way Alison's laid this out is she's listed every collection. And you can see you're still working on some that is associated with, with that library. So again, we can go in through this route. And this is all, again, customizable so that we can access, for example, the Browning Letters collection.
and here we go. And so you can browse and search the collection here. You can include, include collection detail. Um, there are many options for presenting uh, static content in Cortex, and Alison here has made use some of them. You can see here also the sidebar navigation from this point shows all those collections associated with the Armstrong Browning Library. So if I just jump in here, I'm just going to show one digital asset here. Um, so this is manuscript. And again, you can browse images here. And the transcript, This, in this case, this was a pre-generated transcript of these pages. And you can dis see that displayed alongside the assets themselves. This, of course, is searchable. With HTR, as Daryl referenced, if you HTR um, a manuscript item in Cortex, you don't see the transcript, but you can search it, and you see on-page highlighting. So that will show. Again, if you want more information about that, you can just get in touch with us for that. So just a very quick overview of the site to which um, Daryl and the team at Baylor have published all this digitized content that they've been working on. Um, and again, we'll share this URL and do feel free to go in and dig around. OK, from there, I think I'm going to stop screen sharing and come back to the slideshow presentation. And you should see here, this is the link to the Baylor site. Again, we'll share that right at the end, which I think is the next slide. And this is just a slide of a few takeaways that Daryl suggested when considering a migration, and just some useful links um, to go through to. The Baylor link, the link to the Cortex demo site, and the link to Adam Matthews, should, should you be interested in the sort of um, collections that we publish. And I think that concludes our presentation today. Um, but happy to answer any questions um, now or outside this forum as well. OK, great. So now, um, if you're all done, we can go on to um, some of the questions we've got. We don't have a ton of time, but we can address a few questions. Um, and they're good ones, too. So first off, Matthew asked, did you bring the individual Cortex collections live concurrent with your content DM collections, or did you wait to roll over everything when they were all finished with the migration? Yeah, that, that's a good question. We, we did it concurrently, um, which gave us a little bit of a safety net and prevented us from having any uh, collections drop offline. So um, at some point, um, you know, late December, January, we had both, um, you could find both, say, the Armstrong Browning Letters Collection. Um, both, one, we'd have a copy in Content DM, and we'd have also a copy in Cortex. So the only real hard deadline we were against was that April 1st, they were pulling the plug on Content DM. And at that point, so, um, so March 30th, we were really pushing final deadline to make sure at least all of the collections were migrated and that they wouldn't go offline. So we, we had the luxury of doing that. It took a little bit of, we had to do a little bit of things to work that out. But yes, we had, we had a little bit of a safety net there. OK, great. Um, now, and James asked if you could just give us a sense of the total number of records or items that were migrated. Uh, um, for instance, a compound object might be one record containing multiple items. Just, yeah. just the general size of the collection altogether. Sure. So, yeah, like I had mentioned, um, a million, over a million files. But what we're looking at is 117,777 assets. So obviously, each one of those made up of a wide variety number of files. 117,000. Wow, that's impressive. Um, now, were any of these video files? Um, we, no, we did not migrate any video files. Um, we had, we were holding off on uploading video files to Content DM because we were running up against our disk quota. And so we've kind of just been holding them in the wing. And then once we d committed to Cortex, decided, OK, well, we're just going to start uploading them now. And we've got more space with Cortex than we had with Content DM. 
So what we ha are doing is um, we are in the process of compressing all of those video files. So um, from the preservation server, we're compressing them and, get, and, have, and getting them ready for, for Cortex. And those will be going in, as I mentioned, towards the end of summer. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'm really looking forward to clicking over and seeing what you thought over there at Baylor. Um, now, now, Katie asked a good question that I think will interest a lot of us folks in the audience here. Uh, what role do the archivists or curators from the various repositories play in this process? Um, in the migration process, we pretty much handled it all on the tech side. Um, so our group works in uh, library and academic technology services, and so we're very we're, we work in the library. We're very connected with the library. Work very closely with the librarians and archivists. But for the migration, we handle that all within the library and academic technology side. Um, we what we did was early on uh, gave them a little demo of Cortex, uh, and they all got very excited about uh, the new features and also um, knowing that we're going to be able to walk away from some of the bugs that they had been faced with when they have to show off their own collections to classes and, and, and researchers. Um, so we kept them uh, involved in as far as letting them know where we were with their collection and the process and when their collection was going to be migrated. But um, the actual migration process was handled by us in the, in the Riley Digitization Center. OK, great. Thank you. Um, now, Nancy would like to know how Cortex fits into the overall library information technology environment at Baylor. In particular, can you say a bit about what the digital preservation system is that you use? Um, because you mentioned generating new access images from right. your digital preservation system. Right. So we, um, right now, we hand create all of our um, uh, archival information packets. Once items are digitized, they're packed up. Uh, they are checksummed, manifests are created, and they're moved to the preservation server in a specific spot for the collection. And so this is something that we've been hand working on for a while, but I'm happy to say, very happy to say that we are moving towards Archive Matica, uh, and we'll be able to uh, push these into Archive Matica, hopefully in, in the next year, and we'll use Archive Matica to manage this. Okay, great. Um, now, a uh, very... Um Basic question: How does how does the pricing compare between Content DM and Cortex? And that's for you, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, we initially we matched the uh, Content DM pricing um, for Bayer, so um, that was there might be some um, disparity between exact pricing now and in future years, but we started off by matching the Content DM pricing. Okay, um, great, thanks for that. And um, now sort of a conjecture question from, um, from Alan. If you have to redo the migration, is there anything that you would do differently? Hmm, for the migration, um, no, I don't, I don't think I would. I, I'm, Maybe not allow our metadata librarian to leave mid <laughs> mid migration <laughs> if that would be possible. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I mean, she had us in pretty good shape before the migration. Um, I don't think so. I, I think if we go back far enough, uh, I, I would say simpler uh, schema for some of the collections. You know, early on we were very excited about it, like our first five collections, and we would meet with the collection stakeholders, and they're like, "We want all of these fields for." Uh, the objects in this digital collection. And at that time, we were like, yeah, great, let's do it. You've got people to add the, the, the descriptive metadata. And so we went forward with that. That's something I would change from way back. And um, we're, we're obviously applying that to the new collections that are being created now. But um, you, you don't want to lose the ability uh, to have the interoperability between systems and um, allow data to migrate and work between different systems. And so simpler schema, I think, is, uh, is, is the way we're going now. Um, and But again, that would be something I would change from the way back. Uh, the, the migration went uh, much better than I had expected. Um, at some point, uh, I panicked a few times through it, but um, I, I, I don't think there was much. I think it was pretty straightforward. And we had lots of support from Cortex. So we were firing questions at them sometimes two, three times a day, and they would get back to us before the end of the day. So um, 
that was extremely helpful. Okay, super. Well, I, I hope this entire webcast has been um, helpful because I found it very interesting and informative, and we are out of time. Um, I would like to thank everybody for attending today, and this webcast will be archived, and we'll send you an email to let you know when that's available, which is usually in about 24 hours. You can find this webcast and other archived and upcoming webcasts in the events and PD section at libraryjournal.com. And I hope that you will um, be able to use all this information. I found it fascinating. And thank you very much to everybody who took part. Thank you to um, Adam Matthew. Thank you to Daryl. And I really enjoyed being here with you.